Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Retention Chronicles. I am so excited for our guest today. Um, it is not lost on me that this is the first time that we're getting to talk to a cannabis brand. So Luke, thank you so much for being here. If you could start with your background, that would be great. And then we'll dive into it. Yeah, I'm Luke. Uh, I currently am the VP of marketing here at PAX. Been in consumer product space for over a decade. And then the last two years have been at PAX. Um, within my role, manage marketing, customer service, and then also our e experience. So not a lot, not a lot going on at the moment, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Just a couple of hats you get to wear. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. I get to so... see the, the customer journey, especially yes. online. Obviously yeah. in cannabis, you know, so much of the business is done in, in dispensaries and head shops and vape shops. Um, but this, you still, people are still on their phones, et cetera. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's great for us because we're all about customer experience, retention, e-commerce, all that good stuff. But we do talk to a large chunk of brands who also have a lot of um, sales in their retail storefronts. Um, okay. So two years at PAX, I'm actually, I just had my two year anniversary at Malomo. So did you start in June as well? I, uh, I started in September, so maybe I'm a couple months. Behind. Okay. You're, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's uh, I guess the, you know, I wanted to see if we had fun, equal dates, of course. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's so fun. Okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about PAX just in case our listeners aren't familiar with the brand? Yeah. So PAX is a cannabis company. They, you know, we've been in the space for close to over a decade now, I think first coming to market with award-winning line of devices. So dryer vaporizers, concentrate vaporizers, dual use vaporizers, and then, you know, within the last couple of years have started, there's a, you know, a closed loop system of pods and oil extract pods and vape pens that we make, um, all proprietary, patented, similarly award winning. And mm -hmm. so, you know, through that is why we were able to be in both, you know, kind of head shops, smoke shops, vape shops and dispensaries. Um, you know, we... Our, our mission is to create exceptional cannabis experiences that enhance people's lives. And I think what's been exciting in my time here is that we've really leaned into that identity. Yeah, that's awesome. So one of the things that I was really excited about, and I mentioned it in the intro, was this is the first time we're having a cannabis brand on the podcast. So I want to dive into just like all of the industry, because admittedly, I don't, you know, I feel like it's one of those things where unless you're working in the industry, you don't know a ton. So I will admit my yeah, ignorance yeah. there. Um, can you tell us more about just like the journey that PAX has gone through, like since being founded 10 years ago, and then also in the two years that you've been there? Because I, I would imagine just from what I know, um, there, there has been so much growth, just whether it's behind policy or, yeah. um, just social movements and, um, medicine kind of every little bit of life. Can you kind of walk us through like the growth you've seen and, um, maybe some of the challenges and some of the strengths of the industry? Yeah. Um, so at a high level, cannabis is still a schedule one narcotic. And so like at a federal level, it's still illegal. And that has carry on effects in terms of banking, financing. It's the reason why when you purchase cannabis products, you have to do so with like a cash or debit kind of transaction. Um, and it also means that like in the states where cannabis is either medically or recreationally legal, the states are kind of setting the laws for that area. And so mm -hmm. it's like you'll notice when you go from state to state, there are different rules and regulations that stipulate how many stores there are um, and effectively control how many brands there are, distributors, um, what kind of taxes you pay as a business, as a consumer, uh, et cetera. And so that's, that's very, that's a unique element of it. It also means that like, unlike a lot of products, there's no interstate commerce on cannabis. So, you know, what you consume via legal distribution channels is coming from that state. You know, if I'm in, um, Massachusetts or California or Colorado, the cannabis products I'm consuming were cultivated there. Mm. Um, so that it, it's a, and I think we're still in a place where cannabis is a little is stigmatized relative to other goods and products, even relative to newer things like crypto. 
Um, and so that has carry on effects with advertising. You know, there's restrictions in terms of what platforms we can advertise on, what partners we can work with, and it kind of trickles down from their terms of and services. And so that also kind of weighs on what we're doing. And then I, I think, you know, from a, yeah, from a policy perspective, there's still people who are incarcerated because of cannabis. So there is this juxtaposition between kind of startups and businesses that are entering into the market now and people who were kind of the original entrepreneurs from the legacy market who are still potentially wrongfully incarcerated or locked up for doing things that we are now doing in open mm. site. So we're, it's like the, the industry still has a ways to go. I think not only from public perception, but from internal regulations, there's a lot of, there's just a lot that still needs to be done so that it is kind of on an even playing playing field to even something like alcohol. Um, but uh, I think we're closer we're closer than we ever have. You know, this this past week, Minnesota became one of the latest states to allow for recreational um, cannabis. So yeah, we're we're at a place where cannabis is recreationally legal in 23 states, um, and then medically legal in 38 states. So we are go- getting to a place where you know it's like the legal cannabis market is over 30 billion dollars. There's a ton of new brands entering into the space, new retailers. I think more and more consumers are gaining access and safe access to cannabis in legal markets, but we are not yet at 50 states, both medically and recreationally legal. We're not yet at like a policy commerce framework where it's easy for people to start businesses and grow them within a state and among states. So there's still things that to be, there's work to be done on the policy side, on the, you know, the commerce side. And then I think for consumers, hopefully they just yeah. stand to benefit from all of this. Yeah, it's super. I I could see, you know, just with the like growth over the past couple of years. And like you said, was it 23 and then 38 for yeah. recreational medical? Yeah. Um, just the growth there. And then, like you said, there's still areas to grow into. Um, and I, I know just because shipping is obviously Malomo's um, focus and the post-purchase experience but i equate it to like alcohol and you also made that comparison and i know like shipping rules and regulations for alcohol is different state by state and so i can imagine it gets very finicky very quickly when you're in industries like this where it's not um yeah the the connections between states or just on a federal level um are all different and so I also wanted to ask, because there's the distinction then with like medical cannabis and then recreational use. So for you all, is there any differences? Like would someone use packs or one of your products for like medically and recreationally, or is it just one or the other? Yeah, I think it's inner. So I think like the big differences between medical and recreational usage is like, if it, it, there's just different rules and restrictions that govern it. I think like, because people have seen the you know medicinal benefits of the plant you know for certain people they can be prescribed cannabis as a form of treatment and so it's like the rules around like how much you can carry or where and how you can buy the products can be different and so that's but in terms of how people use cannabis i'd say like using cannabis to medicate or using cannabis in different kind of environments for different reasons you can still use the packs to do both i think like the PAX line of devices are known for kind of their discretion. And then from a kind of a general like purity safety perspective, it's heat, not burn. So it's like it will raise the temperature of your oil extract or flour or concentrate to a level where it'll create vapor, but it won't light it on fire. So there's none of the combustion byproducts or kind of harmful substances that you potentially could inhale. So in, in that regard, it's good for both regular consumers and also medical consumers. Mm, okay i'm glad you brought up that distinction with the heat and no yeah. burn because that yeah. that makes a lot of sense um and also i think it's just fascinating that the branding you also mentioned that it's like discretion is maybe what yeah. some of the um your consumers are aiming for and thank you for that background honestly i feel like that was a quick 10 minute um synopsis of the industry that i'm i know is way more complicated than that um but i wanted to dive into perhaps more of the 
fun initiatives you all are working on in the marketing side um, and dive into some of that customer experience retention that you are focusing on at PAX. So can you tell us what are some of the fun things that you're working on? I'm always curious to hear you brought up, like there's only certain platforms that you can run ads on or certain yeah. ways that you can um, showcase PAX products. So can you kind of dive into that aspect of the business a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I think like a, a big focus for us, which has been very interesting, has been, you know, launching our first cannabis products, you know, up until that point, up until recently, we had worked with um, licensed brand partners to produce cannabis products that would go with our mm. uh, line of devices. And now we are you know, becoming more plant touching in the way that we do things. And so, you know, over the course of the last two years, we've launched products in California, Colorado, Massachusetts, and Canada. And then not only singular products, but also product lines. Um, so, um, you know, signature line of pods, um, infused flower pucks, or to name a few. And so that has been really enjoyable. We're really telling those product stories, getting into the details of cultivars, um, strains, you know, telling those stories based on canon and then, you know, seeing how consumers are interacting with the product, you know, IRL, whether it be at launch events or dispensaries or through kind of sampling. So it's, it's been a, that's been a very enjoyable experience. I think we got some great positive validation. We won the, um, one of the high time SoCal awards mm. for our blue dream uh, cultivar. So that was, I think it's good to be known for, you know, we want to be known for the quality of both of the vaporizers, but also what you put in them. And so yeah. that was great for that. And then I think beyond that, it's like, um, big things we've been focused on. It's just finding ways to engage with consumers outside of your traditional medium. So we um, had a Women's History Month campaign last year where we profiled women when in the industry and it tied into our broader campaign of More Flowerful. Um, it was a really cool moment in terms of the kind of content we were able to produce, the kind of profiles we were able to share. And I think we got good press around it. We ended up actually winning a Clio for the campaign, which was cool. Mm. Um, we've of late, we've done more recently, we did a um, collaboration with Stan Birch, who goes by Flu Customs on the internet. He makes kind of custom Nikes. So we made a custom pair of Nike Dunks and we showcased them recently actually at a fashion show during 420 in New York City. Um, and like taking a step back, that fashion show was done in collaboration with Sunday School, which is kind of like a fashion and cannabis brand. Um, you know, during the fashion show, one of the models walked the runway with a, as the Statue of Liberty with like a, a crown made out of Pax Eras, which- Oh, that's awesome. Really enjoyed. Um, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, we got coverage in Vogue and a variety of other publications. So I, I think, you know, where we like moments that are both endemic, you know, very much within the space, but also can have crossover appeal and can get, you know, people interested outside of the industry. Um, similarly, we've, we've been fortunate to work with a number of music artists like Tori Ma and Muna. Um, in the past, The Weeknd, Thievery Corporation, Jenny Lewis, etc. to kind of, because cannabis lives at the intersection of art and music um, and technology. And so, you know, being able to kind of show how it fits within people's lives by way of, you know, something as simple as a music video inclusion, but also mm -hmm. in other, like the content that can originate from that, like behind the scenes or posts. So that that's kind of been what our focus has been. And then outside of it more tactically, it's like, we noticed that our people use our products in a variety of circumstances. And so we've been focused on developing more smoking and utility related accessories for like grinding your cannabis or prepping it or storing it or traveling with it. Um, because we know that, you know, for a lot of people, this is just a part of their life. You know, there's a lot of, you know, functional stoners in this world. And so <laughs> we are trying to kind of support them knowing that like, not everybody who's using cannabis is partying and not everybody who's using cannabis is by themselves. You know, there's kind of a pretty wide um, spectrum between the mm -hmm. two. And yeah. the, the, the profile of a cannabis user is very different. Like while people can use, you know, people tend to use multiple products, multiple form factors in multiple circumstances. And so it's like, we want to be a part of 
that kind of daily experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I love the way you summarized all of that. And I think there's so much truth to, I feel like one of the things in e-commerce or just in general and with business and especially marketing is you're trying to nail down that like ICP, right? Like who yeah. is, how, how can we generalize such a, you know, all these different individuals that we serve and it's a very hard task, um, at hand to do, but I love that you brought it up that everyone can have their own usage or their own, you know, the way that they use packs, the way that it manifests, um, in their life and their cannabis use is unique to each person. And yeah. I also think I don't hear it often on this podcast where um, you're trying to meet customers outside of your typical, you know, marketing initiatives. Like I think sometimes we've, we've had brands that have, have collaborations, but a lot of the times it's like directly in their industry or something very similar, like where the two products go hand in hand together or like a retail launch. Um, so I think it's really cool. Like, I love what you said about um the intersectionality between is it art music and technology with yeah you? i mean cannabis yeah cannabis is a part of a lot of people's day and it's like you know some people use it to get focused some people use it to relax and unwind um other people you know, use it for energy and it's just like more it can be more up uplifting euphoric and i think you know we're trying we're very interested in those moments and it's like how do we capture them how do we um showcase them because I think that there's yeah the types of profiles and personas I think it goes back to like the way that the product has been stigmatized for so many years and mm -hmm. it's like how do you counterbalance that without seeming corny <laughs> yeah <laughs> very fine fine line to draw or to try and make um yeah. and I think too that's also part of I imagine like the clout or I, I hate using that word but it's just descriptive um the the doors that a collaboration with all these different artists um or all these different names would help destigmatize how others who maybe don't use cannabis are looking at the industry um and help maybe propel some of those motions and add to the momentum of those motions moving forward um and i know i also saw and i think you mentioned that you all have like pop-ups and so is that the same thing with like distilleries, like trying out packs in distilleries or is that a completely different? Yeah, initiative? there's, um, I mean, there's rules and regulations that govern it. I mean, I think there are ways you can give out samples and be discreet because we, we want people to try the real thing and experience the real thing. Um, so like the venues where that happens are maybe not always the same, but I think like product education is big. So it's like whether you're in a dispensary or at an event or, or at a space like you want people to know the product story and know what makes it unique ideally in as few words as possible <laughs> right and then you want them to be able to try to have a way of trying the product so that it, you can kind of back it up like when you hear when you read about a specific cultivar or strain like you want to see like oh are like the flavors and the aromas the same or you know if i say that you know putting one of our devices up to four pedals is going to give you a ton of vapor a, like a huge kind of big hit you know I, you have to <laughs> experience that to know that like kind of learn like what is how much vapor do i want mm. in to, my product to be producing and therefore what kind of experience i want to have so it's like those are all kind of a part of the, the what the brand is trying to do because it's like you know like we roughly know where people are shopping and where they're going and you have a sense of what they're doing outside of it but like we don't necessarily have the luxury of being able to interact with people in all places all the time yeah. Yeah. And so do you happen to know, it's okay if you don't, but the breakdown between like where most of your customers are shopping, like, is it mostly online? Is it mostly from distilleries? Is it, do you have we're, that? We're, we're, you, there's no, currently there's no, uh, you can't ship cannabis products. Mm -hmm. You can ship hemp, hemp derived products, but not cannabis ones. Um, so for that reason, it's like any time somebody wants a cannabis product, they're going to go to a dispensary or, you know, mm -hmm. buy it from someone they know in the legacy yeah. market. Um, and then for like, you know, the devices themselves, you could go to online or a head shop or a vape shop or smoke shop or dispensary. So that's a little bit more open. That's, you know, like we, uh, that's more of your traditional e-commerce experience. 
Ah, okay. I see. See, I didn't even know that you couldn't ship cannabis. Um, yeah. So that, and you, it, because of that, you know, you don't, you have to go somewhere. Sh- 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 we still do age verification online and for certain products we have a signature required. So it's like, we do have those kind of regulations in mm-hmm. place, but yeah, with the cannabis, it's kind of a non-starter. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, so this is one of the questions that I love to ask, um, brands whenever they come on the podcast what is like if someone comes and interacts with your brand what message or what branding are you hoping to convey to them yeah i mean i I think for us it's consistent quality it's Mm. it's an experience like when people see the the pax brand name it's you know we've been in the business for more than a decade so chances are people have experienced one, one iteration of our product and i think like the common theme is you know very sleek design very discreet and very generally, you know, easy to use product that gives you what you ask for. You know, there's no leaking or clog, like the less kind of clogging issues, less just every day. <laughs> it yeah. works every day. <laughs> as, it, use, it works as dependable. And I think that is, may not seem like a lot, but it really is. It's something that's very key to our brand identity. And you'd be surprised within this space, kind of what that is. And then... I think, you know, we, we care about positive experiences. We know that like an experience is made of not only the context, but the, the content. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. if we, if we know that you're using if we know that you have all the good stuff, then we can kind of make the most out of your experience. Mm, I love that. Yeah. So by having the, like I'm, cause I'm trying to think through, okay. If you're say you order online from PAX and you've like interacted in person from it, right? Like you've gone to a distillery, whatever. And is there any type of like feedback form that you all are using like surveys for online um, or like at those pop-ups? Like how are you trying to, I guess my question is how are you seeing like how it lands? Cause it seems like, like you said, yeah, that makes sense for a while. Um, like how, I mean, I think how like, are you all confirming? Yeah. You know, one of the strongest proof points is always like sales mm-hmm. and then also returns. Like we have a very low return mm-hmm. rate. So we know that people are liking our products when they get them. <laughs> yeah. That's always both a good thing. From, to have. <laughs> like, both from like wholesale distribution, but also from like direct sales. So mm-hmm. I think that's useful. And then we also invest a lot in like surveys, focus groups, brand trackers, and then kind of collecting field information and directing it back to FAQ. I mean, sorry, it's back to HQ. Um, so it's like when you have kind of a Salesforce and a field trade, you know, trade and field team that's out out there, you can collect a lot of insights. And then we kind of go out of our way to collect more information, both the first and third party on top of that to kind of validate, like, as we're developing a product, there's work that goes into it. Once we launch a product, that there's work that goes into it. And then there's kind of evergreen work that goes into like who, you know, ensuring brand affinity, ensuring product affinity, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. That's, that's helpful to know. And that's what I feel like most of the um, brands we've had come on that have both wholesale and direct sales. One of the caveats to being in wholesale Um, or just retail in general is not having as much customer data as an e-commerce or D2C site would. Um, So it's always, I think that's why I'm surprised like there's not more pop-ups that brands are using because I feel like that direct face-to-face interaction is where you can get a lot of that, um, a lot of that feedback from your consumers. So it makes sense that you can like share that with your team. And then you also get to see like, what's the competition doing? Like, how are people moving through mm-hmm. stores? What are they, what kind of questions are they asking? So it's, yeah, it's a big part of what we do. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, I'm going to pivot just real quick and then we'll come back to the customer experience. So because there are different iterations of different products through PAX, what does like a product launch from the marketing perspective kind of look like? Like, I feel like that's one of the, maybe the most exciting things that you could get to work on. Cause we talked about like collaborations, but the actual different products that you all are starting to release, what does that look like? Yeah. I mean, I I think we, we try to work closely with the product team to kind of get a sense of like, what are the features and benefits? What are the reasons to believe? Like, you know, why are people using this product? 
And then I think, you know, because we've been in the business for a minute, minute, it's kind of like, how do these products compare to their precedents? Like what's new, what's interesting. So that we can communicate to people who know about PAX and then like what's generally interesting and new as it relates to the market. Um, and I think with cannabis products is maybe a little different because it's like, we are not as immediately well known for our cannabis products. So it's kind of looking at like behaviors and trends. It's like, what are the most popular strains or cultivars that people are buying? Like, what are the form factors? And making sure that we're like answering those needs in advance and then telling those stories the right way. Um, and then I think as we get closer, it's kind of like, you know, how are we going to go to market? Obviously go to market is usually going to include some kind of IRL, wholesale, brick and mortar kind of experience and then also kind of a digital experience like and you know hopefully we can use our online touch points to funnel people into stores and help them find the places where they can buy the products um so that, that's kind of generally how things have gone and then once a product launches it's a little bit of a delayed feedback loop because you have to kind of you know you sell products in retailers sell them they place repurchase orders and then you, you kind of use that to inform okay what which skews are doing better than others etc mm, okay that's really interesting that you're kind of using the site as maybe like top of the funnel yeah exactly yeah it's it's a yeah. it's not uncommon for someone to want to look at our website or, and it's we have a good memorable name that's easy to find <laughs> and so we, we want to make SEO. sure that <laughs> yeah yeah exactly we want to <laughs> be doing double duty right like just as much as i want to sell something to someone online i want to be able to get them to the right kind of end outcome. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I also, as a consumer, which I'm curious if you do this at all, um, because I've had chats with my coworkers because they don't do this. Yeah. Like, I'll go on a brand's Instagram and just like look through to see if, especially yeah. if I'm shopping online, um, or if I'm shopping only like with a brand that's only online. I'm like, okay, I want to make sure they're reputable and, you yeah. know, like see what they're all about. So I don't know if you do that, but that's what that reminds me of where I'm like, I will. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's them. not uncommon, you know, you want mm -hmm. the proof points or it's like you look for people's press or you look for product reviews. Like we, we try to be thoughtful of like where are the ways and places people can hear about us and making sure that we kind of cover off on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I also typically ask on this podcast is to like walk through the customer experience. Um, and that's typically if someone is buying online, but because your products are so unique and just the legislation and the, um, not being able to ship the product, obviously we've discussed that. Do you, is it easy for you to kind of tell that story of what a typical customer experience might look like? Um, it's not perfect. I mean, I think you kind of have like your best guess of like, you know, I think even, you know, some people do pick up and delivery. So there is kind of like, there's some subset of consumers that are doing things digitally, but then they end up physically out of space or, you know, they're just chilling at home and it's similar to ordering like Uber Eats. Yeah. Um, I think those decisions, I think it's fair to assume that a lot of people are coming to our website, whether it is to like get more information about a product or use the store locator or potentially buy it or see if they can buy it online. Like we, we try to answer those uh, consumer needs. And then I think like things like email sign up and social follows or just like staying within the community. It's like, maybe you're not ready to buy right now, but you kind of want to stay up to date or honestly, in a lot of cases, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're opening markets one by one. You know, we mm -hmm. recently opened New York city, sorry, New York, but most pr <laughs> prominently in New York city. Yeah. Um, as a market. And that was big news. You know, we have a lot of people on our email list, on our social, who are from that geo area. So you want to let them know, hey, you know, you can now find us at XYZ dispensary. And so we try to leverage, we try to incentivize people to stay in touch because of the, the pace at which we are launching new products and new markets. You know, it's like you, you, we may not be able to serve you now, but in the future, if we can, we want you to kind of mm. stay in touch. Yeah. That's and then you kind of, you'll point. sprinkle in like, you know, product education content, whether it be about the products themselves or more informational. And I think that's kind of how we keep people in the loop. And then we try to be mindful of the fact that like, 
we don't want to inundate people with messaging. We don't want to overwhelm their feed. So I think that has been helpful for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love the, like, I love using email lists or social to keep people updated. As you said, you're launching these new, um, marketplaces. So I imagine like location must be a really important, um, data point for you all to capture with consumers because of just like, I mean, just the state by state, <laughs> um, yeah. different, yeah. like differing state by state regulations. So are, is there anything else that uh, other than like the restrictions we talked like age and whatnot? Um, is there any other like customer information that you all want to capture that's industry specific? Um, not yet. I think that it's, we, we like to keep things open-ended because of the fact that we're not, we don't have the full product portfolio out that we want to have out. Mm. Like we have ambitions beyond what we're currently selling. And so we don't want to limit people by saying like when they first come in to interact with us, like, Oh, what are you interested in? Because I think, you know, people talk, people change their consumption behaviors. They change their preferences. And it's like, we, we, we try to like keep, for now, keep that open. I think as we get farther and farther down the line, potentially there's more legislative changes, potentially there's more like finality with our product portfolio. It'll be easier to kind of send someone down a specific path. But I think we're kind of in that stage where we're still learning from people. And as I yeah. said, like more often than not, people are engaging in multiple mediums. It's like just because you use one product doesn't preclude you from another and vice versa. And, right. you know, at, what we find is like, as somebody become like, comes more interested in something, they, sometimes you want to have, it's like any, it's like, sometimes you want to have really nice wine and sometimes you just want to have easy table wine. That's yeah. Yeah. And it kind of depends on the circumstance and, you know, we want to be able to satisfy those needs. Yeah. That I love, I love that point. Cause I think a lot of the times we just all, and it's like human nature. It's like, we want the answers to everything. Like we just want yeah every, every customer to know everything about every customer, every person. Um, but I love the intentionality behind trying not to pigeonhole people into yeah. different things, just cause yeah. you know, you, you want to try something else or you want to, um, you know, from your all, from your perspective, you want to be able to have customers that don't feel like, okay, you're like, you could only like this product, right? You want to have an array of products that hopefully someone would like. Um, yeah. So I love that. I love that point. It, it also emphasizes or underlines that there probably isn't a typical customer experience. Not really that there ever is. Um, yeah. I mean, look, at the end of the day, if your product's not good, like everything is built on having a good product because like, mm -hmm. you know, word of mouth, like I'm not going to tell my friends about something if I don't like it. The press is not going to cover something if they don't like it. It kind of like, it starts with the product, like, mm -hmm. and the, especially in an environment, like you go into a dispensary, the bud tenders, they get a lot of times is the gatekeeper. So if the bud tender doesn't like your stuff, they're not recommending it. And so, right. you know, obviously get, get having a good product and getting the product into people's hands, especially in those early days is super important. And then you kind of build off of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's the stepping stone. I feel like you need. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. It's not like as straightforward. You know, in a lot of cases, people aren't picking things off of shelves. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. items are behind glass cases. Sometimes they're stored in a different location. Like you really have to, you want people to come in, see a menu and ask for it or go online, see a menu and choose it, add it to their cart and then choose it for delivery or pickup. It's like, there's some intentionality there and you have to help foster that. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned educational content yeah. um, and wanting to share that. And that I assume is perhaps more similar to other brands, um, just generally speaking, like outside of your specific industry. So I'd love to yeah. know more about that content because with the post-purchase experience, that's a lot of what Malomo focuses on is making yeah. sure that when someone gets their product, they're educated about it. So they know how to use it. They know, you know, this is this strand or this is what you bought. This is how you yeah. can like maximize the product that you're using. Yeah. So can you go into more details about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think for like the the devices or vaporizers, use is very important, especially the ones where you are, you know, grinding up flour or taking like solid waxy concentrate and putting it in there. 
Like if you don't clean the, and maintain the product, it will not perform well, <laughs> right. especially after repeated use. And so like care and maintenance is probably one of the most important things. So we, we build that into kind of our post-purchase flows for online. And we're looking, we've, we're really exploring ways to tie it to like signing up for warranty, et cetera, to make sure mm. that like, even if you don't buy with us, we're kind of keeping you in the loop. Um, and then, you know, of course there's blog articles on the website there's FAQ articles on the help site, and then we have a customer service team that can help you. So there's multiple touch points where you can learn how to use the products. We even, you know, we're building FAQs in the product pages, category pages. So it's, we're, we don't want to hide. I think like the good news is our products pretty easy to use. And so, especially our newer products are very easy to use. So that helps for like the out of the box, like every product comes with, instructions use instructions mm-hmm. so helpful to have those are pretty straightforward <laughs> but if even if you throw those away or throw the box away like we got you covered and yeah. then i'd say you know the cannabis products are pretty straightforward it's like what you what you see is kind of what you get mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. <laughs> we try to outline what the experience will be like online and we try to the kinds of cannabis products we're selling are generally available from other brands so you have some baseline um and so there's maybe less product education there beyond kind of telling that strain or cultivar story it's like mm. what why you know how did this come to be what's you know the what are the genetics story behind it what's the there's like a lot of a lot of the the, the strain cultivars have really interesting stories behind them. And so sharing those stories with people. And then I think people then also worry about like, what are the effects? What are the aromas? What are the flavors? Uh, That's when I talk about the experience. It's kind of like, it's similar to like, again, like wine. And it's like, what are the tasting notes? It's like, what do you, what's the bouquet? Mm -hmm. And people care about, as I said, the more you enjoy cannabis as like uh, any other kind of plant-based item, it's like, you know, people really care about what is the product experience like. And so we try to set those expectations in advance so that A, people can like fact check us and be like, does that sound like something I've had before? Does that look like what I, I should be experiencing? But then also be like, oh, that sounds like something I'll like. Mm-hmm. You know, people have, some people are still trained to have preferences. Like I want Indica Sativa hybrid. And so it's like, we need to make sure we have those products and that the products align with what they're looking for. Mm, okay. Yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So is it kind of like there's like basics that pretty much anyone could expect? Um Yeah. Like the yeah I mean it's like uh as long I think we don't we want to be experts, but we don't want to talk in a way that's off putting, right? Like mm, yeah, yeah. We kind of want to be someone okay. when we say something, the heavier users, the enthusiasts are like, okay, what you're saying sounds right. And then for people who are newer or like just getting into um different extraction methods or different product types are like oh okay i get this now thank you for explaining i've always Mm -hmm. wondered you know why what is a live rosin or what is a resin or what you know what makes it special and it's like if we can answer that in a way that like the expert is like yes that's right and then the new (laughs) person is like yes that's interesting then i think we're happy yeah yeah go yeah yeah that makes it goes back to like branding right (laughs) like what do you want your brand voice to be and yeah that, it's like not confident it's like confident direct but also not like over the top you know yes you know, like, like i know more than you type yeah exactly <laughs> yeah yeah i get that it's a fine another fine line yeah uh, exactly yeah yeah so that's awesome so are you sending like are you a fan of using both email and sms this also comes up a lot um with email, like customer definitely, um yeah. sms we there are restrictions around it so mm-hmm. we are Okay. restricted with like who we can work with and what we can do there um i think we believe in sms but it's just like there are some restrictions that are around it it's kind of a similar thing where like certain um service providers won't work with us because of it oh interesting okay yeah even um, in this like 40 minutes or however long we've been sitting here it's like restrictions you just have to find your way yeah it's a part <laughs> of it you know obviously we're we're fortunate in that you know between our legal team between our um government relations team like we are, we we are actively working to change some of these things but you know while the 
laws there you kind of have to adhere to it yeah yeah (laughs) yeah makes sense um okay so last question for you and it's going to be around customer retention because this is retention chronicles so we got to do it um how are you as a VP of marketing, looking at customer retention, like how are you measuring it? What incentives are you using to try and maximize it and grow customer retention? Um, super curious because we haven't touched upon that specifically yet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the the biggest one for us has been the product experience. Our retention is largely built on the product and the product experience. Like our products lend themselves well to repeat purchase behavior because mm-hmm. if you like, for the PAX era platform, if you like it, it's a closed system. So it's like, you'll continue to like it and we'll continue to offer you what you want. I guess it's not any different to like Nespresso Mm -hmm. where it's like, if you (laughs) like the Nespresso system for its quality, it's ease of use, it's consistency, you're going to stay on the system. And so the product is like a big part of that. And then I think on the flip side, like uh, the PAX platform is more open-ended. Like I can take my favorite flower, concentrate and put it in there. So I'm not restricted. And so for that product, it's more about the accessories and like, how do I accessorize and how do I? And so for us, it's like, how do we develop experiences that enhance it? And it's like, you know, you sell someone an iPhone, but there's the case, there's the, you know, the pop socket. There's there's a lot of things you can like. Yeah, all the add-ons. Yep. Um, and then I think beyond that, it's just kind of how and where we show up. I think brand affinity is important um, post-purchase. And then I think like the product education piece is also important post-purchase. Like if you can ensure that people enjoy their first time using the product, they're much more likely to want to come back. And it's like anything that we can do to make that first experience as good as possible, um, you know, whether it be through email, site, social, training, education, et cetera, that's good. And then, I think anything that we can do to make the brand stickier, you know, it's like, how do we create more branded moments following purchase so that if you see us at an event or if you see us on somebody, you want to like reach out, you know, we've heard of people getting tattoos of brands uh, that they love. Um, yeah. <laughs> we actually had an event recently where we were giving out tattoos and people, some people got branded oh, tattoos awesome. oh and God, it's like, I, I think that. there's, there's levels to this. And I think we're, we're always interested in like, how do you build affinity? Cause it's like, if this is one of those things where it's like, if you're trusted, it, the, the ha- behavior is very different than otherwise. Yeah. And what a better way than to get a tattoo to say, <laughs> I exactly. enjoy this brand. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I love that answer. And we haven't had anyone yet who um, has had a similar initiative that they were starting with um, offering free tattoos. So I love ending on that note. <laughs> Um, this has been great, Luke. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and sharing about the industry. It's all super fascinating to me. So I know our listeners are really going to enjoy it. Great. Well, thank you for having me.